this lab, we will examine the properties of sulfur, which is a non-metal solid. As always, before beginning any experiment in the laboratory, be sure you are familiar with laboratory safety requirements. For a demonstration of basic lab safety rules, you can watch our video entitled Lab Safety. On the periodic table, sulfur is placed on the right side in group 16. Sulfur is in group 16 because an atom of sulfur, like other members of that group, has six valence electrons. The atomic number of sulfur is 16, which means that an atom of sulfur has 16 protons and 16 electrons. The density of the most common form of solid sulfur is 2.07 grams per cubic centimeter, which makes it about twice the density of water. Sulfur exists in more than one elemental form. Elemental form refers to a single atom of an element, or to a molecule consisting of atoms of only one element. The different elemental forms of an element are called allotropes. An allotrope is a chemical substance in the same physical state, but with differing arrangements of atoms or molecules. Sulfur exists as about 30 different allotropes. Some of the more common allotropes are indicated with Greek letters, such as alpha sulfur, beta sulfur, and chi sulfur. The most common allotrope is alpha sulfur. The sulfur powder we have already seen consists of alpha sulfur crystals that have been ground up into a powder. The atoms in alpha sulfur produce crown-shaped molecules of eight atoms each. Intermolecular forces produce intermolecular bonds that hold the sulfur molecules together to form a crystal structure. The crystal structure of alpha sulfur consists of rectangular and pyramid-shaped crystals called orthorhombic crystals. Alpha sulfur burns with a light blue flame to produce two extremely toxic gases, sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide. You can see the blue flame of burning sulfur in this nighttime video of a volcano in East Java, Indonesia. Alpha sulfur melts at a temperature of 118.9 degrees Celsius, so we will heat some sulfur in a beaker on a hot plate. The sulfur melts to form a yellow liquid. As we continue heating liquid sulfur, the yellow liquid turns red. As the temperature of the sulfur rises, Intermolecular forces pull sulfur molecules closer together to form a thicker red liquid. Eventually, the red liquid turns into a thick black liquid. The intermolecular forces form long chains of sulfur molecules with eight, nine, and 10 sulfur atoms. To see the next allotrope of sulfur, we need to rapidly cool this black liquid sulfur in a beaker of cold water. Because the liquid sulfur cooled rapidly, the intermolecular forces did not have enough time to reform as crystals. Instead, the sulfur remained in long chains of sulfur molecules that formed a rubbery, pliable, amorphous sulfur. Amorphous sulfur is an allotrope called chi sulfur. If the chi sulfur is allowed to remain undisturbed for a while, it will eventually revert to alpha sulfur. The last allotrope of sulfur that we will examine is beta sulfur. Beta sulfur crystals are long, thin crystals called monoclinic crystals. To see beta sulfur crystals, we start with 250 milliliters of an organic solvent called dimethylbenzene. Dimethylbenzene is flammable and mildly toxic, so this part of the experiment must be performed under a fume hood. To aid us in this part of the lab, we will use a magnetic stirrer with a stir bar. An electromagnet in the base of the stirrer will cause the stir bar to rotate rapidly, so the contents of the beaker will be constantly and evenly stirred. Next, we pour in the 250 milliliters of dimethylbenzene and add 25 grams of alpha sulfur. The base of our stirrer also contains a heater, 
which we will use to heat the dimethylbenzene to 85 degrees Celsius. Now, we switch on the heater and the stirrer. It will take several minutes to dissolve all the sulfur. While we wait, let's talk about some sulfur compounds. Sulfur is a reactive non-metal that forms compounds with many other elements. As we mentioned earlier, sulfur reacts with oxygen to form gases, such as sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide. Both of these gases are toxic industrial waste products. Sulfur also reacts with oxygen to form sulfates, such as calcium sulfate, copper II sulfate, and iron II sulfate. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid made from sulfur. This common laboratory acid is used to process numerous other chemical compounds. If sulfuric acid is added to sucrose, which is a form of sugar, the acid causes the sucrose to decompose into carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Watch what happens. As soon as the elements separate, the hydrogen and oxygen atoms recombine in a ratio of two hydrogen atoms for every one oxygen atom to form water. The chemical reaction produced enough heat to cause the water to boil away, leaving only a residue of black carbon. Sulfur also combines with most metals to form metal sulfides. A common metal sulfide is iron 2 disulfide, which is also known as pyrite. Pyrite has been called fool's gold since it has been mistaken for gold. The synthesis reaction of zinc and sulfur produces zinc sulfide. To synthesize zinc sulfide, we mix 25 grams of zinc with 50 grams of sulfur in this beaker. The synthesis reaction will be conducted outside for reasons that will soon be apparent. To safely ignite the mixture, we will use two sparklers like the ones used for fireworks on holidays. We dump the mixture onto these fire bricks. Now we ignite the sparklers and move to a safe distance. As the chemical on the sparkler burns down, it ignites the mixture of zinc and sulfur. Let's watch the reaction again in slow motion. As we can see, the synthesis of zinc sulfide is quite exothermic. The reaction produces zinc sulfide powder, which is a white powder used as a pigment in paints. We can see some clumps of zinc sulfide that were formed by the reaction. The exothermic property of sulfur is also evident when it is mixed with potassium nitrate and charcoal, which is an allotrope of carbon. You may know this mixture as gunpowder. Gunpowder is an explosive substance that must be handled with care. When we ignite gunpowder in the open air, the mixture burns quickly, but not explosively. However, if gunpowder is placed in a closed container and ignited, the reaction is explosive. By now, our sulfur should be fully dissolved in the solvent. So let's return to the lab. Now that the sulfur is dissolved, we turn off the heater and the stirrer, remove the stir bar, and let the solution sit undisturbed. It will take several hours for the sulfur to recrystallize, so we will speed up the camera action. Notice the monoclinic beta sulfur crystals forming. We can see the crystals clearly if we pour off the excess dimethylbenzene. In this lab, we looked at the properties of the non-metal sulfur. In future labs, we will take a closer look at the non-metal carbon and examine some organic compounds. At this time, proceed with the corresponding activities.